Before we begin this Microsoft Digital event, we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we live and work throughout Australia, as well as the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people viewing this event today. We pay our respects to Elders both past, present and emerging, and recognise and celebrate their continuing connection to land, waters and community. Our reverence also extends to all First Nation and Indigenous peoples, as well as their ancestral lands. My name is uh, Mark Simos. I'm a lead cybersecurity architect at Microsoft, and I spend my days um, putting myself in the uh, in the position of um, a uh, CISO, Chief Information Security Officer, CIOs, direct reports, uh, technical managers, architects, uh, practitioners, and oftentimes business leaders, and trying to figure out what they need to know about uh, cybersecurity and how to um, how to meet those needs and answer those unanswered questions. Um, and so that's uh, kind of my role, building reference architectures, reference strategies, et cetera, um, from that. And so uh, today we're gonna be going through uh, a lot of our lessons learned and uh, security best practices around um, Azure and cloud security. So the big thing um, to kind of set context from a big picture perspective, is that there's multiple transformations going on at just about every organization um, that we work with. Um, you have the, the market is changing because of the availability of cloud technology and social media and all these kind of um, different ways of doing things where people get what they want on demand, they're ordering stuff online, et cetera. And so this is driving nearly every business to work hard to meet those needs and go through a digital transformation um, this all started with, you know, uh, not not as I started with, but it was um, really well known with, you know, the way Netflix uh, changed the way uh, video is delivered and Amazon uh, changed uh, a bunch of things up with how people buy things. And so expectations are different in the marketplace and this is affecting every organization. Now, the business is going through this digital transformation and what's next happening is that there's a cloud transformation because the IT teams um, need to now adapt uh, cloud technology and developers and application developers need to do that to keep up. And then of course, you know, there's a, a there's pressure on the security teams to one, secure all these new types of assets that are different than, you know, the on-premises servers and, uh, and applications that we're used to. Um, but there's also the attackers are getting better and better at using some of the same cloud technology and other just, you know, uh, business model improvements, quite frankly, on the attacker side to really increase pressure and so security is is really working and uh, and um, working with all these uh, different things and feeling the pressure from all sides to transform and catch up. Um, we normally call this a zero trust transformation um, is what uh, security transformation is called. And this is affecting a lot of roles in the organization and a lot of different functions as well. And the, the big thing to keep in mind here, kind of the takeaway is that essentially everybody's on their back foot. Um, everybody is going through this transformation. Everybody is figuring things out. There is no master three to five year plan where we know exactly what's gonna happen month by month in those three to five years. 
that era is gone. We are in an era of continuous transformation and everybody is adapting and figuring out what consumers want, what the cloud technology providers are putting out there, what the attackers are doing and trying to process all these changes. And so it's really important to have a lot of empathy as you work with uh, other folks within the organization and kind of recognize that. And then, you know, work uh, with them to how do we integrate in your processes? How do we make sure that we're connecting, you know, as security professionals to uh, what's changing in your world? And things get a lot better uh, when you approach that. We, we, it, when you approach it that way, we've seen um, uh, organizations as they progress through this and sort of get this and start doing it and build the skills and the muscle. And um, it's an amazing transformation and people are honestly a lot happier. It's a challenging thing to deal with this change, uh, but when you're working with it as a team uh, across these, um, everything works a lot better and it's, it's a lot more fun. So um, within the security space, Microsoft has made a lot of investments to help organizations um, uh, handle all these all this change that they're experiencing, not only in the digital transformation space, but also in the, in the cloud transformation space, but also in that security transformation, the zero trust transformation. And so see, these are some of the fundamental elements that are going to go into a lot of the things you'll see. But we're very focused on visibility. Um, we, we collect about 24 trillion signals every day that we use um, as context to train our machine learning and artificial intelli intelligence algorithms to you know, be able to detect anomalies and things that are not quite right. Um, we, uh, of course, that machine learning itself needs experts to be able to do it and to be able to program it and interpret the results and act on them. And so we've got um, about 8,500 folks. Um, you know, and this number varies, of course, by the by the week and month, but um, we have quite a few people and this number has actually grown a lot. It used to be 3,500 about, um, I think, a year or two ago. Um, and so um, that investment that we put in there in, in people and, and, uh, and just sheer dollars on security research and development really is, um, you know, giving us the tools that we need to help our customers with um, the challenges they're facing. And we, another fundamental thing that we are focused on is an end-to-end -end approach. We want to make sure that we're not looking at this, oh, this is a network problem. Oh, this is an endpoint problem. Oh, this is an identity problem. Um, or this is an app problem. We want to have an end-to-end -end view that really enables, you know, uh, solutions that help solve the problems that security organizations are facing. Now, security is used to, you know, kind of buying, you know, uh, kind of the old habits of buying something that fits in a 19-inch rack. Um, and uh, that instinctive like problem, match a solution, install the appliance, wire it in, um, that doesn't work anymore. You actually need to have end-to-end -end approaches um, that, uh, that uh, deal with um, the problems at hand. And of course, you know, we're there to help. Um, if there is an incident, we do have incident response teams that um, are starting to go back on site again as we're, you know, kind of getting towards the end of uh, COVID, but ultimately they're there to help in the case of, um, of an attack and help uh, with the response, with the recovery, and also with um, uh, you know proactive architecture and, and helping uh, solve the problems before they uh, become incidents. So ultimately, these foundational elements then lead us to okay, what are the outcomes that customer organizations need to deal with this uh, uh, security transformation? Um, so you need security by design, always up to date need to be able to support these faster development cycles, these DevOps and infrastructures code, um, rapid development cycles with, you know, Agile, Sprint, Kanban, you name it. Um, need to have centralized visibility and control. If you, if you don't see it, you don't even have a chance of controlling it or blocking it or doing something about it. Um, so you absolutely need to have that clear, coherent, central visibility and control. Um, and you need context. You need to be able to understand it. What does this alert mean? What does this anomaly mean? Um, so the more that we have that's fed by that threat intelligence, that's fed by the artificial intelligence and sort of filtered by it and cleaned by it, um, the, the better you're able to make a decision so we're not wasting the time of these precious humans, um, which is the most uh, rare resources we have. And then um, automation. Um, there is... Um, it's our automation. You can't say enough good things about it. It's so important to helping get out of that manual drudge work that burns out those um, security people that are at the heart of this. Um, it's really, really important to have that um, enablement of people to be successful and automation and all these other elements help contribute uh, to that by just taking those repeatable uh, manual tasks off of their plate and let human mind do its 
designed to do best, which is figure out new problems. And then when you pull all this together and you um, actually have an effective approach to security that's really aligned to the business and supporting these things and has these hallmarks, security starts shifting from um, a, a negative and a drag on the organization to actually being a business enabler. And this is a very powerful um, thing to, to, to keep in mind and make sure that you're, you're able to understand and communicate. Because when you do security right, you take this you know, modern zero trust uh, approach as you go through this transformation, you can actually increase business productivity by allowing people to work wherever they need to be, what, whatever network, whatever location, at home, um, on the road, different places. And that increases productivity, it helps the organization work better. Um, shortening time to value, getting to that yes faster instead of taking a no approach to everything. But let me go ahead and partner with you and tell you how to be safer. Because ultimately, you know, uh, Mr. or Mrs. Business Owner um, and Asset Owner, this is the risk that you face. My job is to help you and advise you on how to be as safe as possible. And then you judge the risk. And so getting, getting to that point where business owners are empowered and they're not dealing with either fear or frustration from security, you really shorten that time to value that the business can realize. And then continuous improvement. The more that you do this over and over over time, the more that it builds on itself and gets you that business agility you need to be able to capture opportunities. Hey, we need to go into um, and, and enter this new market, this new country that we don't have business in, and we want to be able to instantly um, or very fast report on compliance and get everything done. So very, very um, uh, powerful when you are able to um, do security well and quickly. Um, and it really enables the business to be agile and meet the opportunities where they are. So now let's take a moment and talk about how Microsoft actually protects our environment because this oftentimes helps illustrate um, some of the best practices that uh, we're gonna be going through in just uh, a little bit here. So when you look at the way Microsoft approaches it, there are some distinct uh, differences, um, but they're fairly minor between how we protect our corporate environment and how we protect our cloud environment. Um, uh, you know, essentially the back end of Azure, Microsoft 365, Office 365, um, et cetera, Xbox, you name it. Um, but ultimately these things are have much, much, much more in common than they are different. Um, so ultimately we start with you know, the basics, all the things that everybody would expect. Um, and we do have some documentation uh, that'll be showing up in just a moment um, that kind of you know, can go through some of these things that you can read up and, and get some more details. But you know, things like you know, hardening, the, the you know, physical security, the operating system, application data, whitelisting, automatic patching, um, all those kind of you know, traditional preventive controls. Um, with a heavy focus that we also bring in that we don't want to just have that checklist based security. We want to be making sure we're thinking like an attacker that we're thinking in the graphs and the, you know, how do I get from point A to B to C to Q um, that the attackers think about. And so we not only are continually scanning, um, we're also doing penetration testing, which is, you know, sort of your static, can I find one way in? We have a lot of red and purple team operations um, to, uh, we have multiple different red teams across the company. Um, I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head, but a bunch of different teams that are attacking different environments. Um, uh, oftentimes they get together and do joint exercises, you know, which also you know, kind of helps them from a mindset perspective because they get to attack different things and add a little variety to their work. But you know, they, they simulate a, a dedicated attacker or a determined attacker um, that is um, constantly trying to get into the environment. Um, we have bug bounties and uh, all sorts of other ways to make sure that we're constantly keeping that attacker's eye view at top of mind. Then um, one of the biggest investment areas that uh, we put in is privileged access. Um, you can't focus on this too much. Um, there's a big difference between losing one user a standard user that has access to us to, you know, who knows, maybe a, a hundred or a thousand documents versus an administrator that has access to hundreds or thousands of users who each in turn have access to hundreds or thousands of documents and systems. So it's really important to put that proportional focus, the higher level of focus on your privileged admins, not um, 
not just on your standard users, not just treat them like a standard user. So for those uh, folks, we put um, a lot of focus in background checks, training, conferences. We want to make sure that our people are educated and that we're keeping a, an eye on them. Um, we want to make sure that the um, authentication for them is very strong. We also have multi-factor authentication across all of our regular user population, but the, one of the first ones that we enforced it on was the admin population um, with a rigorous anomaly detection. Least privilege access, making sure that um, there is no standing privileges. You have to go through a process every time, a just-in-time process, um, to be able to get access to it. Um, and this has actually influenced a number of our, our public solutions. Um, and then this one is a little bit, uh, this one isn't necessarily a um, widely adopted industry best practice. We've been recommending it for about 10 years, um, but it is um, does take a little bit of investment. Privilege access workstations. So we've been running this, uh, this architecture for quite a long time, as I mentioned. Um, we call this our secure access workstations, um, or is our internal program name, but privilege access workstations is the, is the uh, recommendations and documentation that we put out there. And this one is super critical because we want to make sure that an attacker can't simply um, take over a standard workstation and then use that to steal admin credentials and elevate themselves. And it's very, very critical to make sure that the workstations that these privilege credentials are used on are at or above the trust level uh, that they need to be. So it's super important to have that protection there. Um, and, and that uh, increased security for those workstations they use. Um, so ultimately a separate operating system. We have quite a bit of guidance there that, um, that we published on that. Uh, but, but you know that all up is how we approach that privileged access element. Obviously there's a lot of code that's being developed um, in all of these environments. And so we follow um, our secure development lifecycle using secure DevOps kit, um, uh, Defender, Microsoft Defender for Cloud, um, kind of automated checks and a whole bunch of other things to make sure that these environments and the code in them are highly secure. And of course, we've got to monitor this all the time. And so we actually at Microsoft implement a model um, that we call our Cyber Defense Operations Center um, or CDOC. And uh, what this is, is it's uh, kind of a fusion center model where we have multiple teams that are doing security monitoring across the company, SOCs, if you will, that um, together work out of one facility. Um, I'm not sure if we've actually gotten back in the building yet since uh, COVID, um, but you know, working in uh, a joint facilities actually around the world um, and um, you know, working together as a team so that if something is uh, found in you know, the Azure environment, that that insight is shared very quickly in the context of it by working shoulder to shoulder um, with uh, Microsoft 365, the corporate IT environments and all those different places. Um, and uh, these practices that we uh, that I just described here are actually documented well. So there's a Microsoft documentation link, and there is also a uh, in the Service Trust portal. Um, there's a uh, a number of third-party validated documents, um, you know, that we have to file for compliance reasons, et cetera, where we describe this entire approach and program um, that you can check out. So uh, lots of good information for you there. So we know that we can't do this alone at Microsoft. And so we uh, built a program that we call our uh, Microsoft Intelligent Security Association, or MISA. Um, and this is where we work actively with um, all sorts of uh, leading uh, providers all across the industry um, that you know uh, help with integration, that have um, tools that we integrate with, et cetera. Um, so uh, lots and lots of partners here that we work with to make sure that we have, that as people use our capabilities at Microsoft, um, that they benefit from um, all of the wisdom collectively of all this, and you know it works with the capabilities that are already in uh, in, ex in the existing environment, um, et cetera. So we want to make sure it's a smooth experience um, to integrate Microsoft's uh, capabilities. So that's a a very strong focus of ours that we've invested in quite heavily. Now let's shift for a moment here and talk about what we actually face as a challenge. Um, this particular slide is a really good way to, uh, the information on the slide is a really good way to very quickly understand the challenges we face because we have sophisticated high-end attacks, which we tend to see hit the headlines fairly, um, uh, fairly often, whether it's a ransomware attacks or log4j or a number of different other ones. 
but um, ultimately you have that leading edge of new things, but then you have a commoditization dynamic where a lot of those techniques sometimes take minutes or hours, sometimes takes weeks or months, but they become something that's then bought and sold on the dark markets, the black markets that the attackers use um, to exchange um, goods and services, including um, attacker for hire. Um, hey, I want to attack an organization. Uh, it's usually 250 and up. Um, ransomware kits. Um, it can be as simple as buying access to the kit, you know, $66. Or what we're seeing more and more is um, the affiliate model where they uh, essentially the the operators of the ransomware kits give you know a percentage of the profit usually around 30 percent to the people that authored it who are then maintaining it and keeping it up to date with newest exploits etc so um, that's really what's been fueling and driving the uh, the ransomware and extortion attacks that we see uh, compromised pcs and devices um, that have been infected by malware and botnet, et cetera. You know, fairly cheap on the PC side, 13 cents US, 89 cents US is the range. Mobile devices tend to be a bit more expensive, um, almost a dollar to almost three dollars. And by the way, these numbers have stayed fairly constant over the past four to five years. They bumped up a few times and bumped down a little bit. And um, we haven't had to update this slide, honestly, that much um, because um, there hasn't been significant changes. Um, spear phishing for hire. Hey, I want access to this account, 100 to 1,000 bucks roughly, um, uh, to be able to get control of that account. Stolen passwords are really, really cheap. So in you know about a dollar per thousand, um, and when you buy it in bulk, you of course get a discount. Um, and so what this translates to is about a 1% hit rate on any given enterprise on average that the username password will have been reused from one of these. Um, stolen password um, collections um, with the um, with an account on uh, on an enterprise, and so it tends to be very cheap to use those in. One of the reasons that we um, invest in MFA so heavily. Um, denial of service, about eight hundred dollars a month U.S. give or take to keep a website down. Um, this is generally an unprotected by uh, DDoS protection uh, for those distributed denial of service attacks. Now. These um, the commodities and these attack techniques becoming commoditized and, and very well used, you know, essentially available to buy and sell, have heavily driven our investments. So native threat detection is, uh, is, a, is a huge area that we're focusing on to make it as easy as possible to detect and respond to threats, you know, whether it's Azure, Azure AD, Windows, Linux, iOS, Android, AWS, GCP, you name it. We wanted to make sure that um, there's a set of tools and capabilities, which we'll talk about more in the best practice section, that are just natively integrated, easy to use, already know how to um, work with those particular things. You don't have to write a SIM rule and all that stuff. Um, and of course, the SimSor UEBA that's in the cloud, you don't have to set it up. It's pretty much like, you know, as a service, similar to the way Office 365 is, you don't have to set up an Exchange server, SharePoint server like you used to. So same idea with uh, Microsoft Sentinel there. So passwordless and multi-factor authentication is another huge one that I mentioned earlier. Um, we see um, on the identity attack surface, what we see in Azure Active Directory for the attempted and, and, uh, and successful attacks, we see that multi-factor authentication would block about 99.9% .9 of them we see. Now, does that mean you're perfectly safe if you do that? Not quite, because there are more other attack um, approaches, but it does indicate the level and the volume of attacks that are out there. Um, that are trying to use um, uh, password only accounts and so it's super critical to make sure that you have that multi-factor authentication in there we've recently added to azure ad the ability to um, pick the strength in conditional access um, so you can actually filter and say i only will have strong mfa and you can kind of pick and choose uh, from that um, native firewall network security to um, help with those DDoS attacks and the other network-based attacks has also been a key investment area for Microsoft. And of course, we don't just you know, put out capabilities, you, know, you have to be able to use these and be successful with them. And so we work um, with a lot of different customers, um, with uh, NIST, US uh, National Institute of Standards and Technologies, CIS, the uh, Center for Internet Security, um, the Open Group, I'm actually the Zero Trust Architecture uh, co-chair of that um, forum there. 
uh, working group, sorry, the working group. Um, so a lot of direct work with industry to, to bring in the best practices and also to share what we have learned. And then we publish that out with the top 10 best practices, which you'll be seeing here in just a moment. The Azure Security Benchmarks, the Cloud Adoption Framework, Well-Architected Framework are kind of the per enterprise, per workload uh, guidance and more. And so um, we're very, very heavily invested in making sure that our customers are successful. This um, is our approach to the top 10 security best practices. Um, we really focused on, we want to make sure that each of these were actionable, but still holistic and have that sort of end-to-end -end view we discussed earlier. And they kind of blend the short and the long-term things you can do immediately and the things that you can make incremental progress on so that you're continuing to move towards um, that better North Star. And we divided this into four different areas. Um, people, process, technology, and then some foundational architectural decisions. Um, so we'll kind of go through each of these um, specifically. We kind of talk about um, uh, the importance of people, process, and technology and, and those foundational decisions as we go. So first is people. The, the big thing to remember is that even though we're talking about technology risks and attacks on technology platforms, and it's a very technology-centric conversation in many ways, it's people that operate these things, it's people that secure these things, it's people that set up the controls, it's people that respond to the incidents. Um, it's very important in security to remember that you have to make sure that people are able to be successful. And the two factors that we found that are very critical on this are one, they need to know what they're dealing with. So people need education on this cloud journey. They need to understand the context. What is happening? What is the business trying to do? What workloads are they trying to move? What kind of threats are we facing? How does this shared responsibility model work? Because what do we have to do? What does the cloud provider do, um, et cetera? Um, and so it's very, very important that people understand the context of it so they can make the right decisions as they're moving fast and trying to keep up with everything. And by the way, um, one thing I, I forgot to mention is that each of these best practices, which I'll get the link to at the end, um, is documented um, and it includes lots of links to references that you can use to learn to learn and read up on all these topics I'm talking about. So you don't have to memorize everything I said. You have to go and search for it. Um, it's all linked there in the top 10 best practices. So you can rest assured there. Second thing here is, in addition to sort of the big picture context, okay, I know where I am, I know what land I'm in, I know I'm, you know, uh, in this place. They need specific details. They need to understand the cloud technology. And um, especially as we're transitioning from, you know, kind of an on-prem world to a hybrid multi-cloud world, need to understand how Azure works, how AWS works, how GCP works, how do we, how do these things work, and you know, what are the different ways that the protocols work, the tools to secure them, the, the access controls, the monitoring, the logging. Um, they have to, people have to understand all of these things and the technical details in order to be able to do their jobs successfully. And a big thing here to keep in mind is it is a continuous learning mode. It is not a you know one-time thing um, that you, hey, I learned this thing and now I'm done. It's continuous. Uh, we'll take the SOC as an example or a security operations center. So within the SOC, there's been a, a bias towards network security, right? Like the rest of security, like, hey, we, we do detections off the firewall, the IDS, IPS, and then we block the IP. Um, and then we clean up anything that they might have compromised. So that's sort of how security started, um, you know, 5, 10, 15 years ago, depending on your organization. Um, but, you know, those folks now need to learn, okay, well, we now have cloud apps in our portfolio. We now have AWS workloads. We have um, Azure workloads. We have GCP workloads. How do we now secure those workloads? And how are the attackers going to work with it? How are the attacks going to look? How does the OAuth and OIDC authentication flow work on Office 365 or Microsoft 365? Because we might not have network intercept. We may not have network data on this. I have to go and look at the logs that describe the authentication process. If you don't know how that works, then you're not going to be able to interpret the logs and figure out is this legit user traffic? Is it attack traffic? Is the attack, what is the attacker trying to do? You have to look at those logs and have those logs and you have to understand what they are. 
and then it's going to be continuous. There's going to be new things that pop up and oh, we just had our first um, uh, our first Azure workload, our first GCP workload. We just added a new SaaS app that we're using for, for ERP or for workflow management, et cetera. How do we go ahead and do that? It's a continuous learning process. So next up is process. Yes, I know we're all technology people. We all love now. Well, we don't really love process. Um, but process is actually critically important. It's what allows us to um, to continue to do um, good things and make sure that they're done over and over again. And so the, the three process elements that we identified that are very critical uh, from a best practice uh, perspective as you're securing Azure and your multi-cloud environment and really just security in general. Um, first is to assign accountability. So if nobody knows who's going to actually make a certain type of decision you know a network security decision a network routing decision a um, access control decision uh, uh you know what logs we need security operations type of decision if that person hasn't been identified or that team hasn't been identified nobody's going to make the decision and if nobody makes the decision the project is you're going to go forward without the decision being made which probably means it's insecure or the project isn't going to go forward because we're waiting on security. So we've learned that it's super, super important to make sure you have a very clear understanding of who's going to do this. And we actually include the specific list of decisions we found, decision makers um, that we need to um, identify, including which teams typically take these on uh, from a from a typical on-premise environment uh, type of uh, role. Um, so we've provided that uh, guidance there to help accelerate that because Getting to the cloud um, is actually really does improve security significantly, and um, we want to make that make sure that security isn't holding that up and ironically holding um, security improvements up. Second thing, um, rapid incident response number four there. Um, the risk to an organization is driven by how much time an attacker has access to your resources. So obviously would love to block every attack. Realistically, that's not possible. So we have to make sure that in addition to those preventive controls that block the attackers from getting in, that we have invested in rapid incident response and that all of your processes to do incident response are updated to the cloud. You do not want to be figuring this out during the first attack. That is a very, very bad time to be figuring out how to get logs, how to investigate, how to figure out what the attacker does. So super critical to make sure that you have invested in making sure that you have rapid incident response um, uh, as you integrate cloud into your platform, um, you know, Azure and, and beyond. Um, number five, posture management. This is huge. In the on-premises world, our ability to do preventive controls was usually, you know, an audit every year or two, maybe every six months, depending on the org and the, and the regulations. And vulnerability scanning, you know, are we missing a patch? That's pretty much what we had. That's the tools that we had. So you sometimes had a vulnerability scanning team. You sometimes had a governance team, but it was by no means continuous. It was an every once in a while thing. Um, and it was, it's pretty painful. Um, the cool thing about the cloud is because it is software defined data centers, um, uh, especially in Azure, you can get really, really good information on not only what vulnerabilities and patches are missing for the uh, for these workloads, but also the configuration of your Azure tenants, your uh, AWS accounts, your GCP. Um, forgotten what the term was over there. I think they're also accounts and not 100% on that. Um, but all of the different tenant and instance um, items, all the workloads on them, the databases, the containers, we can now provide continuous monitoring in near real time that says, here's what your security posture is. Your configuration is good or not good. Your vulnerabilities are good or not good. And it creates this awesome dashboard. The question then is, who's going to use it? How are you going to use it? How are you going to do this posture management? And so this is sort of a, a it's a new function for many organizations in security. And it's really important to stand this up because this is one of the best ways to get those preventive controls in place to block the attackers before they get any success in the environment because they can't find an unpatched machine. They can't find a misconfigured um, account or uh, S3 bucket or whatever the case may be. 
it's very, very important to get someone on this. Take full advantage of the fact that you have this continuous visibility, this continuous monitoring into your security risk and posture and do something with it and work with the IT operations teams and the DevOps teams to help fix this. So don't just you know throw a report at them and say, go fix this. Actually say, you know, how can I help you? How do your processes work? How can we bring security in and help you with some expertise? Maybe write a script, maybe help you develop a process, maybe integrate this into your, um, your CI CD workflow. Um, you know, one of the uh, stories that um, uh, that um, that is just far, I've seen it far too often, is you know DevOps team adopts continuous integration, continuous deployment, CI CD, integrating you know all the software, all the things they need, you know rebuilding as needed, just very very quickly, very automated. Go in and manually patch something in there because it's out of date. CI CD comes along again and overwrites that and runs it back to the old version. Because you know the automation is great, it's powerful, but if you try to do it the old way, the manual way, you might end up getting bulldozed by the automation. So it's very important to work with these teams and integrate in with it. And so part of posture management is kind of working with those teams um, to figure out how to put it in their process, their infrastructures, code, DevOps, you name it. Technology. Finally got to the technology section. I know some of you are waiting for that. Um, Number six here, password MFA. I've already um, talked about this quite a bit. Super, super, super important. This helps knock out so, so many, so many attacks. So just do it. If you haven't done it for anyone, do it with your admins first and then roll it out to everyone. But roll it to everyone as fast as you can, starting with admins. Seven and eight are both related um, around simplicity, especially as organizations are going to the cloud. It's a little bit overwhelming sometimes. There's a lot of things to learn, a lot of things to do. And so um, sometimes the simplest, easiest thing to do is we're just going to take our existing tools and processes that we're familiar with and bring them to the cloud. And that does work in some situations sometimes, not always. Um, a lot of times you end up having to create VMs and set up special routes and all these other things. And as the DevOps teams are, you know, landing things quickly and new environments are standing up and migrations are rolling, that manual effort and coordinating three or four different teams to set up the network and set up the VM and then set up the software on it and then configure the security and the firewall rules, it just becomes a nightmare to configure and to, uh, to bring together. So sometimes using what you have, um, doesn't translate well to the cloud and people are like can I just have a checkbox firewall please I just need a straightforward simple capable firewall to meet compliance and security requirements and so that's effectively what we've done is we provide those network security and firewall capabilities that are built in to the the, the Azure vnets and um, and into the uh, subnets so that you can set up network security groups and control that a uh, very similar security groups if you're familiar with AWS not exactly the same but very similar and then the Azure firewall, um, which is a you know, fully capable firewall with IDS, IPS, all those kind of things um, in there. And then on uh, the threat detection side, this is, uh, this is a particularly painful thing because most security folks are used to being familiar with the kinds of instances and the kind of things that you would have on premises. It's a VM, um, it's a SQL database, et cetera. And you know, there's a fairly mature set of SIM queries out there, sometimes good, sometimes not, that can help you with detections, et cetera. And you can kind of survive on making your own queries. When you get to the cloud, the logs are different. There's more logs and the logs are much more verbose. So one, it's gonna stress your SIM out and start you know, stressing your, uh, uh, your storage capacity um, and budget sometimes. Um, and two, getting people to the point where they understand Azure Kubernetes or um, Azure Firewall or any of the other cloud-based um, uh, capabilities, um, you know, SQL databases, VMs, you name it, app uh, services, and then being able to detect and to understand them, one, two, detect anomalies on it, and three, clean it up so that you have a, a high true positive and you're not sending a bunch of false positive alerts to waste um, your, your SOC analyst time. 
that's a very, very hard thing to do. And so this is why Microsoft has invested very heavily into XDR tools or extended uh, detection response tools, because we want to be able to take that beautiful end to end view of the SIM, like you know we have with Microsoft Sentinel or other capabilities, but instead of having to do everything manually with the logs, let's get tools that are specifically focused on endpoint, on SQL, on Kubernetes, on Azure storage, et cetera, to, to enable them to have good, clean detections that the uh, SOC analysts can action on and spend their time there chasing the, the, the adversaries investigating remediating instead of on trying to figure out a SIM query. And so that's that's been a huge, huge thing that we found is to really embrace those XDR tools in the cloud. Now, one of the things that we wanted to highlight here is that there's a little bit of two worlds coming together, especially as you get more and more into the DevOps space, which more and more organizations are. There's an infrastructure side, which is sort of all the different uh, things. Here you build automation, your uh, servers, your tester workstations, um, developer workstations, et cetera. There's a set of attacks that the attackers can use to get at, at with you know at, at your um, your application and, and, and customers and data, et cetera, through the infrastructure. And infrastructure people tend to be able to, you know, make this list very quickly in their head. But then there's a whole set of things around the application itself and the design of it, how it was coded, any supply chain components that came in that they, you know, brought in off of uh, GitHub or some other location. Um, and so you have all these different uh, development process ones, which, you know, an application developer would be, or an application development security for person would be very familiar with and be able to come up with a list on. It's very, um, it's very rare, unfortunately, right now that we see people that have instincts to look at both sides of it. So we wanted to really make sure that you're thinking about this from both sides as you look into all these preventive and detective and responsive controls that you have the ability to detect and respond and prevent attacks um, on both of those elements of it because they are kind of two different worlds, um, but the attackers honestly don't care. They'll use whichever one gets them to their goal. And then, you know, one last thing on DevOps here before we kind of um, get to the last best practices. Um, we've learned that in the DevOps space, there's two different things that are kind of at a dynamic. One is this modern dev operations sort of DevOps, you know, rapid iteration, ongoing agile innovation, you know, adding code, et cetera. But there's also a reason why waterfall existed in the first place. Now we don't want to over pivot and try and bring back waterfall. We're not trying to do a retro thing here. But you know, while you're incubating an idea before it hits production, before it uses you know customer data out on the internet, et cetera, you know, there's this concept of an MVP. And oftentimes the MVP is just defined in terms of business requirements, sometimes in terms of sort of quality of performance. But the way that we think about the MVP is really about um, for that minimum viable product, does it meet the business requirements, you know, as decoded by the developers? Does it meet the, the minimum security compliance and safety requirements for that SEC on the DevSecOps? And does it meet that quality, performance, reliability, scalability um, that your um, IT operations experts um, can bring to the table? And this is a minimum viable product. This isn't perfect DevSecOps. This is the minimum viable product to make sure that it's good enough for the first release. And you kind of set that standard, securing the design, the code, the environment. And then as it goes into that rapid iteration phase, okay, it's in production. Let's keep adding features. Let's keep adding improvements. Let's keep um, adding security. Let's keep introducing that. We want to make sure that we're doing it right and that we're continually improving on all three of those dimensions. And yeah, you know, specifically within the security space, you know, as you go through and you add new features, let's go ahead and bring in a threat model as we're opening up the design during that phase. Let's make sure as we're thinking about personas and who's going to use it, that we have an attacker persona. What could they do with this application and abuse it? Um, securing the code and making sure that you've got, um, you know, your, your, your static and dynamic analysis tools that are providing bugs in a very seamless way that show up exactly where every other bug does and that they're you know providing only high quality stuff they're not a bunch of you know spray and pray type of reports that you know just you know create a bunch of noise for the developers and of course securing that develop that environment which is you know again that those two halves of it not just the code but the environment it's running it then you want to continuously improve the entire life cycle you don't want to just say okay we define the mvp 
back in 2018 and we're going to do that forever and ever and never look at it again. You want to take a look at your MVP definitions. Do they need to be improved? Is there a, was it a little bit too restrictive? Was it a little bit too permissive? Do we need to adjust it a little bit more? Um, and so you're continuously improving that. Hey, I just found a new way that we can detect um, uh, this particular kind of bug, and it's a very high true positive thing. Let's go ahead and put that in there. Where this one's throwing way too many false positives, and it's annoying the dev. Let's go ahead and pull that one out until we can get it up to quality and, and work on it. So continuously improving the process itself. Um, so this is what we've learned as um, your DevOps and DevSecOps uh, progresses. So closing it out, um, there are actually 11 best practices in our top 10, so um, it goes up to 11. Um, the, the last three here are really about setting up a foundational architecture. We want to make sure that for the decisions that we're going to have to live with for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, that we're making our lives easier and we're not adding friction every day of those 5, 10, 15 years. And the things that we've learned, um, and this is a blend of what we've seen in the cloud, but also what we've seen uh, from the on-premises space, is you've got to have a single directory and identity. Whenever you have multiple directories, multiple identity sources, um, and you don't have that sort of consistency there, you end up with friction. You end up with friction for the identity management. You end up with friction for the users. You end up with friction for security operations that are trying to figure out who did what when they're investigating an incident in minutes matter. Um, you end up with all this friction in the process. So consolidating and getting that single modern um, identity like through Azure Active Directory um, really, really, really makes a difference in your processes everywhere. And everybody is much happier when you have that. When you end up with multiple directories to manage, it just, it just cascades into pain. Identity instead of keys. So kind of sticking with the identity theme here. Um, Keys are often used for authentication. Um, oh, we have a key to access this storage account or this uh, database or whatever. Um, this was kind of an initial mistake of a lot of the, the early cloud providers and services was to use key-based authentication. It was kind of a necessary thing because we had to stand it up before you know we had full maturity of things like Azure Active Directory and other identity providers. Um, but as much as possible, avoid key-based authentication because keys have to be managed. If you lose the keys, you lose access, you lose control of it to the attackers. Keys are like handling raw nuclear material when you're bare hands, you don't wanna do it. The identity systems have already built around workflows, lifecycle management, multi-factor authentication, all these kind of um, identity governance and uh, management things that make it easier. So every time you have a choice, make it a policy, um, uh, look for it, search for it. As much as possible, you want to be using identities, not keys, um, whenever you have that choice. Single strategy, number 11. This is what I like to call the misaligned cheeseburger. If you have an identity team that is got one idea for how to do segmentation isolation, a networking team that has a completely different idea of how they're going to break things up and segment things, and then the business team looks at those and says, I, those have no relation to what I'm doing and how we actually care about assets and, and business assets, you end up in a situation where you're, again, creating a whole lot of friction all the time. So it's really critical to get everyone together on topics like the segmentation strategy and the value of assets, um, what are business critical assets, et cetera. Super important to get everybody on the same page with those, get the teams together and uh, bring them together. Um, oftentimes when we do um, workshops with our customers to help them plan their um, uh, security for their cloud adoption, we pull people in the room, ironically, as security people that have never talked to each other, or these teams were formed 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, and they haven't talked since. Um, and so it's super important to get everybody talking, working together, um, not just among business, IT, and security, but also within security and technology teams. Um, super important to have that going. Um, just closing out here real quick, um, want to make sure that you're aware of um, all the different uh, Azure security technology that is there to protect both Azure as well as, um, in many cases, um, uh, AWS, GCP, um, and on-premises sort of hybrid uh, scenarios as well. So um, uh, just a, a list of technology there for you to check out. Some really, really good stuff here for network security, for the apps and data, threat protection, 
Um, identity access is fairly simple, just Azure AD. And then that posture management, which I've referred to many times as Microsoft Defender for Cloud, just announced recently, Microsoft Defender for Cloud um, supports um, not only Azure, but also AWS and GCP. Um, uh, so a uh, great way to get a single point of view. And of course, um, it also uh, supports on-premises uh, servers as well, and databases, containers, you name it. So went through all of these already, but this is the top 10 plus one um, best practices. Um, big thing I want to focus there as in that top left, that Azure Security Top 10. There is a what, why, how, and who that talks about the different roles and why why we're going to do each of these, what it is, the different roles that help, and um, how to do it, and uh, instructions step by step, etc. You know, links to those types of things. And so, really want you to check that out. Um, and at this point in time, would love to uh, take some questions. We hope you enjoyed this digital event. We have specialists on standby to answer your questions for a short while. To ask a question, type it into the chat window now and we'll get to it as quickly as we can. You'll also find a resources widget in the bottom middle of your screen. We've put additional links in there to learn more about what we've covered today. Lastly, tell us how you found this experience through the survey widget. If you're not staying for the Q&A, thank you for attending and we hope to see you again soon.